So just a reminder to you guys too, we're recording this and sending it off to uh, Book TV tonight too. Don't forget, so we'll be uh, sending it to them ASAP. No pressure. Well, I just took off my glasses. <laughs> okay. All right, so everybody, we're gonna we're letting people in the room right now. So if you guys are watching, we're just going to hold for just a moment while we uh, let everybody jump in the Zoom room and get uh, on Facebook Live. So just give us one second and we will get started. Okay. All right, hey everybody, this is Jeff Martin with Magic City Books and the Tulsa Literary Coalition. I'm so happy to welcome you to our weekly virtual event series that we've been doing for several months now, mostly on Mondays and Thursday evenings. Um, and this is a really exciting, fun opportunity. Um, you may or may not know that Tulsa is one of six chapters throughout the country to host a, a PEN America chapter. So we have PEN America Tulsa. Um, and I'm really proud to say that I'm the leader of that group. And it's been a relationship that just gets better and better. We've had the opportunity to do several events with PEN, um, probably prior, even prior to our affiliation as an actual chapter, and really started laying the groundwork for this relationship uh, moving forward. And it's something that if you don't know the work that Penn does, I mean, it's very uh, inextricably linked to what we'll be talking about tonight in many ways. Um, but Penn is a, an amazing organization that advocates for, for authors, for freedom of the press, for all kinds of important things that are tied to the mission that we have as well through Magic City Books and the Tulsa Literary Coalition. Penn is a membership-driven program and, and organization. And if you don't know their work, I would invite you to go to pen.org and see everything that they're doing, especially right now. There's so much going on with limitations to uh, press freedoms. Every day something's happening uh, that we wouldn't probably know about, at least I wouldn't know about, uh, were it not for the work that's happening at Penn. So we have a special membership promo going tonight. So if you go to the website pen.org, you can use the code PENFRIEND. That's all caps, P-E-N-F-R-I-E-N-D, and get 20% off your membership. So support Penn and the great work that I'm happy to say we as an organization do, and um, more to come on that. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking with the CEO of Penn America, Suzanne Nossel, who is, I'm happy to say, a friend and um, someone who I very much look up to as a, a leader in this world that I somewhat take part in. Um, I've had the chance to talk to so many authors over these past months, but I'm always thrilled when someone else wants to take that opportunity away from me. Uh, and, <laughs> and I actually get to watch and enjoy an event instead of uh, having to run it. And um, my friend, Dr. John Schumann is not only a longtime friend of Suzanne's, uh, which they will probably get into how they know each other at the beginning. But uh, John is also a board member of the Tulsa Literary Coalition and a huge advocate for the work that we do uh, through TLC and through Magic City Books. And, you know, it's just a great all around guy and an advocate for the arts and the culture here in Tulsa. So John's gonna take the reins. If you guys have questions, we invite you to put those into the Q&A here on, on Zoom and we'll incorporate as many of those as we can. If you don't have this book yet, Dare to Speak, the book which we'll be talking about tonight, a book which I would say, by the way, does something that I love a book when it can do. It has something in it that pisses off everybody in the best possible way. If you think you're on one side of an issue, there's gonna be something in here that will challenge what you believe and what you think you believe. And to me, that is a really uh, powerful thing to do to kind of make us question um, what we think of as freedom and what we uh, believe in as kind of the tenets uh, 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 at the core of all of us. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to get the book, we'll be posting links to buy the book through Magic City directly. And we'll do that several times through the talk tonight. So you'll have an opportunity to do that. So I wanna say a big, big welcome and thank you to Suzanne Nossel and Dr. John Schumann. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, so welcome, much. Suzanne. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's fun to be in Tulsa, even though I'm not in Tulsa. I wish I were. We wish you were here. We definitely wish you were here. And at some point when the pandemic recedes, we definitely want to get you here. Um, well, yeah, I, I really like the book. It really made me think. And uh, congratulations, because it's very, I, I was so impressed with the 
thoroughness. I mean, it reads, I'm not any, in any way a lawyer or legal scholar, which you are. <laughs> Um, and uh, you, I mean, in some ways, the second half of the book reads, you cite many, many um, famous Supreme Court cases, but I thought where we could start, um, because I lead a college campus, that was one area that you focus on a little bit in the book is college campuses and freedom of speech and um, call out culture. And I could just start by saying you taught me something, which I sort of knew, but I didn't realize there was this term call in um, and so I guess, could you just differentiate between call out culture and, and what you hope people do with call in? Yeah, sure. I mean, we've done a lot of work on campuses at PEN America over the last four or five years and really become somewhat alarmed by the witnessing that a rising generation seems to be increasingly skeptical about free speech. And I can understand why. I mean, for them, they tend to hear free speech principles invoked in relation to speech that is hateful or menacing or derogatory in some way. And, you know, the professor or the other student uh, says, well, that's, you know, it's free speech and the university protects it because it's free speech. But if you hear free speech invoked only in that context, you can see why someone might become dubious of the idea of free speech. And that's actually one of the reasons I wrote the book was out of this concern that we're at risk of losing a rising generation when it comes to believing in the principle of free speech, which you know, I grew up seeing as a bedrock of the US constitution and our, our culture and sort of what makes this society great. And so I think it's extremely important that we find ways to reach this rising generation. And, you know, when it comes to call outs and call ins, you know, I would say, just to ground it a little bit in, you know, my interpretation of a lot of the controversies that go on on campus is that there is a tension between the drive that students and many faculty have to render the campus a more equal, inclusive, and just place, and to eradicate the legacies of discrimination and exclusion that are so stubborn in this country and that we're now reckoning with at a new level amid the protests of the last few months. But sometimes that effort, as, as noble as it is, can kind of veer across the double yellow line into a degree of censoriousness when it comes to seem that the best thing to do to foster a sense of belonging among students from marginalized groups or to combat bigotry would be to ban or punish speech. And you can understand why that idea comes up. In my analysis of sort of calling out and calling in really has to do with how you respond to speech that you find offensive. Uh, so if a professor you know, this is a common scenario that a professor will verbalize the N word in class. This is, this is happening you know. twice in this calendar year at the University of Oklahoma. Yeah, I mean, it's just happening all over the country. So they, they, and you know, they may be quoting James Baldwin, they may be quoting Mark Twain, they may be teaching uh, a law school class about the doctrine of fighting words and trying to give an example that's going to rile people up a little bit. But what we find is increasingly sort of students have a very strong reaction to this and they think it's objectionable no matter what. It doesn't matter that the purpose was pedagogical or that the professor didn't mean any offense. And so the question in a situation like that, it doesn't have to be the N word is, you know, what do you do? And a call out is to publicly shame the person. Uh, you know, through, it can be through a petition, it can be through social media, it can be face-to-face -face confrontation but it's something that's visible to everyone. A call-in is a different approach. It's behind the scenes. You're approaching someone privately. Your goal is to tell them, look, you've offended me or you've offended other people or you, know, you may not realize how your words came across, but not to shame. And it really depends on the circumstance, whether you think you can get through to the person, was this intentional or unintentional, were people hurt by the words and do they need to hear your allyship and that public demonstration of support? So I sort of outline here are the criteria you can use to determine which of these approaches makes more sense depending on the circumstances. And uh, I, you, you mentioned apologies and actually you have a pretty nice short chapter on uh, that includes a, a Apologies. So, what what's the what is what are the components of a of a good apology or a true apology? Because we're our I think our culture and our news media are replete. Our our politicians, for example, are very what feel like insincere 
uh, apologies. Yeah, no, it's true. And, 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 and I think, you know, that one of the results of that is that there's very little space for apology and forgiveness in some of these free speech battles. You know, to me, a, a convincing apology is one that really accepts blame for what you did. You're not apologizing just because someone else was hurt or bothered, but rather because you acknowledge that you did something wrong. It has to be encompassing. It can't be parsimonious where you're kind of clearly delineating and drawing sharp lines around what you accept blame for and what you don't. It needs to be more encompassing. It has to be sort of searching in the sense that you're willing to acknowledge that what you said, even if you didn't intend it to be racist, look, maybe it does reflect your upbringing or background or certain blind spots that you had. In some instances, it may entail outreach to a group with which you've had limited contact because you don't really know much about you know, the LGBT community and there's some work to be done to get to know it better so that you don't stumble into the same mistakes in future. You know, one example, uh, you know, just in recent days of what I call pseudo apology is, uh, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, you know, was called a very nasty sort of misogynist slur by uh, a representative from Florida. And he purported to apologize, but in so doing, he A, denied having said it when there were witnesses and B, went on and on about the fact that he has a daughter and a wife. And so, you know, he's someone who's good to women. Uh, and so she skewered that in her kind of apology rebuttal uh, on the floor of the Congress. Yeah, that was an impressive speech. Um, let's broaden from campus culture and talk more about the broader culture. And when we talk about call out, there's this idea of cancel culture um, where people, we, we have these uh, tools now, social media, Twitter in particular, but other, you know, others, Facebook, where somebody does say something offensive or somebody unintentionally says something that does offend people. And very quickly, there can be what feels like a storm of protest where essentially there's a cry out to cancel that person. Um, and, and, you know, and some of this, of course, is involved from the, the Me Too movement. So there have been, you know, I think legitimate legal calls to, to uh, try people. Um, but there are many examples you cite in the book. And I was just wondering if you could broaden and, and talk a little bit about cancel culture, but how, you know, we can protect free speech, but also, you know, be mindful. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the problems with cancel culture is that the term is used so elastically. So it can be invoked to refer to everything from, you know, as you say, instances in the Me Too movement, like a Harvey Weinstein or a Bill Cosby, where they've been convicted of crimes and they do get exiled from the culture. And I don't think anybody takes much issue with that. And then there are other instances where, you know, someone tweets out something that, uh, you know, is seen as contrary to the movement to defund the police or is construed as, you know, uh, antipathy toward transgender individuals when that may not have been the intent. And, you know, that lone, you know, singular act of speech and expression can in turn evoke this huge backlash and the, per the view can be the person becomes almost untouchable. And not only are they stigmatized, but anybody who engages with them, you know, uh, uh, the stigma carries over. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a sort of societally enforced isolation that extends to you know concentric social circles and, and and professional circles and i think that phenomenon is destructive it's uh it's excessive uh you know it's it's draconian it uh you know there's a kind of enforcement where if you don't adhere to it you know you may become tainted and put your own reputation at risk as well. And so I think that's the level of cancel culture that concerns people. And, you know, it's also of indefinite duration. And, you know, it may be one mistake that, for example, an editor makes publishing a piece, you know, for example, the New York Review of Books publishing yeah. a piece on Me Too that was highly controversial. And then all of a sudden, not only was Ian Baruma out as editor within a couple of days, but publications to which he had contributed for years suddenly said, eh, you know, we can't publish you anymore. He became kind of untouchable. Uh, you know, in his case, I don't think it's permanent. And, you know, I also think it's incumbent on institutions when that does happen to, you know, after a period of time, create some on-ramps so that people are not effectively 
silenced and marginalized forever, you know, particularly on the basis of a single act of expression or decision that doesn't warrant such a, such a uh, you know, harsh and lasting response. We have a very uh, current uh, situation in Tulsa that, that I'd like to ask you about um, that I think is going on in other places as well. But um, around the time of Juneteenth, uh, President Trump was gonna hold a, a rally here that was controversial because of the pandemic uh, and the, the idea of a large public gathering. Um, but what happened was there were um, many people in the black community and also allies who, uh, painted Black Lives Matter on a stretch of Greenwood Avenue, which is the historic area where the Tulsa race massacre occurred almost 100 years ago, 99 years ago. Um, and then it's uh, been there for, well, two months now. And um, it's been a place of, you know, of healing and gathering for many people uh, until recently the head of the Tulsa Republican Party uh, said that uh, he or the party, I guess, wanted to paint uh, it was a back the blue or baby lives matter. And if you know, if you were going to allow one instance of free speech, you had to allow others. Uh, and then it went on where there was actually some defacement of the Black Lives Matter with it with a blue line. And then people came out um, to clean that off and repaint it and then also to counter protest. So um, the city council is sort of stuck in the mayor with, with what to do. And it, um, I guess if you could help us sort through that thicket, it's, it's, um, it's complicated. Yeah, it is a thicket. I mean, it sort of connects to these protests that have happened around the country in connection with monuments and names. You know, for example, you know, at, at, at Yale, where I know you went, the debate over whether to rename the houses and sort of what messaging a city or an institution should be putting forward collectively and how, how those statements of values are, who gets to decide what those statements of values are and when they should change, uh, you know, is, is sort of what's up for debate. I, you know, I generally think those questions are not really what matters of free expression, that a community can change its mind if they decide, you know, they no longer want to have uh, a statue of Robert E. Lee, like that's perfectly within their rights. That's not infringing on anyone's expressive rights. Now, a, a question of, you know, this, I take it was sort of a municipal decision. I'm not sure it was. I know it was in other cities. In New York City, there's Black Lives Matter outside Trump Tower. In Washington, it's prominently on the street there. And so, you know, I think whoever is in charge of the municipality, whether that's the mayor, or the city council, should have the right to decide what expression is going to be uh, conveyed in those public spaces that are under their control. Now, if a contingent is saying, you know, the messaging that you've chosen, you know, neglects uh, the role or importance of another institution in the city, and we want that reflected in some way, I don't think that's a, a free expression right that they're asserting, but it may be, a, a, you know, a, a right of a sort to be recognized and acknowledged. And I think, you know, it may make some sense to try to find a way of doing that and, and to, you know, show a respect for, you know, and, and that's a discussion, you know, here in New York as well that, uh, you know, is coming around that, that uh, you know, you want a level of equilibrium between the message of Black Lives Matter, but uh, not completely undercutting the role of the police. And so, you know, perhaps there's another part of town where an alternative message could be conveyed. Perhaps there's a discussion, you know, oftentimes on all of these issues, what we find, and it's, this is complicated by the pandemic, is that if you can get people in a room, in a conversation to explain here, hey, here's why painting that blue line through our message, you know, was not something that's acceptable. Here's what that signified to us. Uh, you know, and, and, and talk through what it is that they're trying to achieve. Sometimes, I won't say always, but sometimes you can find a solution that will be acceptable. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it is definitely of the moment. And uh, I think that uh, our mayor and our city council are somewhat paralyzed. A couple of our city councilors have come out very strongly in favor of, of maintaining it and keeping it. Uh, others, not so much, but it's, I mean, the city lawyer uh, has actually de declared it's, you know, it's, it's an illegal, basically, form of street art or graffiti. And so that's, I think, where in some of the trouble lies with, with the, you know, the city ordinance, but we'll- Right. We'll, well, that's a different, right. That's a different situation than, than the, the other cities, if it's not something that was officially authorized. But nonetheless, the city may want to decide, look, this is not the moment, even though it may have violated the ordinance, this is not the moment to, 
you know, paint over that message. And that's symbolically, given the history of Tulsa and sort of where you are, you know, that's the wrong, that's not the right answer for this moment. I want to turn to um, this whole idea of information and state control. And you talk uh, both your work at PEN America and also in the book, Dare to Speak, you talk a little bit about China. Now, interestingly, I wasn't aware of the fact that China in its, I guess, constitution um, does uh, to free speech. Um, but as you point out in practice, that there couldn't be further from that. And at PEN America, you have, um, you've published the list of, I think, 80 or so examples of how China um, oppresses people, uh, artists, uh, journalists, people who, who try to tell the truth. And um, you don't see that really getting better anytime soon. No, it's getting much worse. I mean, this morning I was woken up by you know, a, a message, I mean, last night in Hong Kong, they arrested a m major media tycoon who's a known pro-democracy advocate, Jimmy Lai. And so that was, you know, as part of this crackdown that's happening in Hong Kong with the inaction of the new national security law that, you know, once democratic, very open, I don't know how many people in the audience have been to Hong Kong, but if you go there, or if you went there at least, you know, uh, a few years ago, it feels like a very open place. It's got wonderful universities, uh, human rights lawyers, a vibrant media scene, lots of journalists. And it's historically been the place where all the Western media organizations and newspapers would have their staff headquartered because it was so much freer than in China. And, uh, you know, Beijing right now is just, uh, clamping down in a very harsh way and has enacted this new law and they're, you know, rounding people up. And I was called about, you know, how journalists could get lawyers and international legal assistance. So it's, uh, it's a very sad situation. And, it, you know, what it reflects is Beijing's arm getting longer and longer. We actually issued a report just last week on the influence that China wields in Hollywood because Beijing uh, and uh, the Chinese government has through you know, semi statal investors that now are major power brokers in Hollywood, as well as through access, its control over access to the Chinese market, which has become a huge film going market, uh, the world's second and soon to be the world's largest. So Hollywood studios want their movies to be shown in China, and they're willing to give up a lot in exchange for that. You know, if that means uh, surrendering the right to criticize the Chinese or depict the Chinese negatively in any way, that's actually a bargain that they are willing to make. And so we document this in a report and it's just one example. There are other people have written to us since talking about how the same thing goes on in the gaming industry, in academia here in the US, Chinese students who pay full freight have become a major source of revenue for US universities and their strings attached to that. And so this question of China's glow, you know, not just what goes on inside China, which at Penn America we've been concerned with for a long time and remain so, and it's getting worse, but their growing influence around the world as a superpower and an economic force and bringing with them this, you know, approach to free expression that really takes the words on the page of their own law and international law and uh, just decants all meaning from them. Well, um, sticking for a second with the China example, um, you mentioned how the Hollywood movie studios are willing to make that compromise in order to access the Chinese market. Similarly, our technology companies, particularly our behemoths like I guess Facebook or Google, um, agree also to Chinese censorship in order to enter uh, the Chinese market. And you, you talk at, at some length about uh, the technology companies and how both, A, how um, we can hold them accountable. I thought that was particularly interesting. In fact, I wasn't really aware. Uh, I know a lot about the criticism, certainly, of Facebook and its founder and CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, but I wasn't aware that he had, in 2019, just last year, uh, put forth the idea of an oversight board, which was, I, I think they proposed something like 40 people uh, to be on this uh, sort of, and you you call it another thing, but I think that's their preferred term, but like a citizen um, advisory board where, th where this board could essentially decide what, uh, it, almost offloading in a sense, 
the responsibility to um, have Facebook, the platform itself, uh, not promulgate hateful or um, you know, false information, for example. Um, so where, are, where is Facebook in that discussion? I know that just, it was last week, I guess, the four big tech companies all testified remotely um, in Congress, some of them for the first time. But is that, is that moved ahead at all? Yeah, I mean, just one small thing is uh, those major U.S. tech companies are not in China in any meaningful way because of the constraints that were on them when they tried to be in, and in particular the Chinese government's, uh, the power that it uh, holds to requisition any user data that it may choose. So if you post, you know, this happened, uh, you know, 10 or 12 years ago when the companies were in China in the early days, uh, a dissident would post something, you know, there was a case with Yahoo and they requisitioned his personal data from Yahoo. Yahoo had to turn it over because that was a condition of their ability to operate within China. And, you know, the person was sent to jail. And so they were not able to figure out a way around that. And they have exited China for now. They sort of make tentative forays. From, they all want to get back in because it's such a huge market, but they haven't been able to work out how, we've done a lot of work at PEN America just underscoring that there really is no way to have even a shred of credibility on free expression issues while operating inside China. Now that's become an issue for, for Hong Kong as well. You know, when you come to their global role and their role here in the US, you know, I, what I lay out in the book is, you know, there's sort of two sides to the coin. On the one hand, we should be leery of these massive companies that control such vast swaths of our public square. I mean, they've essentially rolled up the functions that were once performed by, you know, newspapers, magazines, coffee clutches, bulletin boards, uh, town meetings, you know, so many different facets of civic life that you can remember from the, you know, 70s, 80s are now sort of rolled up into one family albums, you know, college reunions are all sort of happening on these same platforms. And so they control so much. And I think we do need to be leery about giving them unfettered jurisdiction to arbitrate speech because they have their own profit motives. They have their own ideologies. Their algorithms and business models are a feed off of this kind of incendiary content that uh, can be very explosive and can elevate the most provocative, outlandish, whether it's conspiracy theories or uh, you know, other kinds of uh, extremist content that really are privileged sort of technically uh, and algorithmically within the platform. So you know, there's a lot about those platforms that we really can't trust uh, and need to be very, you know, keep a very sharp eye on. At the same time, I think I do think we need to hold them accountable and ask them to do more in terms of addressing the ways in which online car content is so manifestly harmful. And you know, you can just go down the list. You know, cyberbullying, online harassment, disinformation. You know, in the in the context of COVID, disinformation in the context of our politics, which is undercutting our democracy, suppressing the vote. Uh, you know, casting a, a pall on mail-in ballots, all sorts of things. So we need them to, we do need them to play a stronger role. I think they will play a stronger role in moderating and mediating content. They're under pressure to do so from consumers, from their advertisers, from regulators, uh, now on both sides of the aisle. And what I argue in the book is that, you know, with that, we need to create a kind of fail-safe and a corrective so that as inevitably there are more false positives and there's more content that gets taken down uh, from the platforms that people who believe that their free speech rights have been impinged upon have a ready recourse and can actually get a human being on the line to make their case and get their content reinstated if that's appropriate. That doesn't exist today. There's almost no customer service. Now you asked about the, the content oversight board it won't play that role. What it will do is look at the most difficult kind of borderline questions, like a, a, you know, a video of Nancy Pelosi that slowed down so it makes it seem as if her speech is slurred. You know, should that be taken off Facebook or not? And what they want is in those tough kind of line drawing situations to have recourse to an independent body so that they are not forced to render all those decisions themselves as Facebook and they have a measure of 
deniability and objectivity that comes into the process, which I think is, you know, has the potential to be positive. They haven't started, this board has been assembled in part, but hasn't started its work yet. I think the most important aspect of it may be that it will have a kind of jurisprudence while they'll render public decisions that you and I and others will be able to look at and analyze and be able to anticipate what's going to happen next with a given area of content. One of the biggest problems with the platforms is the total lack of transparency and not uh, having any insight about how these decisions are made, how much content is being taken down and what kinds of content. And so this is one small step in the direction of greater visibility on the part of the public and researchers who really need to much better understand this. So you, you mentioned coronavirus and misinformation, and I'm assuming you finished the manuscript for this before the pandemic? I mean, because of the long time that it takes yes. to book map. Yeah. But you wrote an article uh, title that was given the title, Truth Has Become a Coronavirus Casualty, I think in, um, I think that was in March in foreign policy. And I guess I'm wondering what your thoughts are about, because I mean, we've had a difficult time communicating public health officials uh, and experts in trying to convey messages around health and safety uh, because there is so much misinformation and outright hoaxes about various cures and vaccines and things. Um, and in fact, you know, misinformation about the disease itself. Now, part of that is because it's a science that's going on in real time and we're learning so much as we go along here. Um, but, you know, I guess in a, in a um, what would you like to see in a robust democracy with a first amendment where, I, I mean, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm guessing you would assume that, that, we would all sort of, you know, fight for truth um, and just essentially quash some of these, these falsehoods that are so easily promulgated. Yeah, look, I think there's a couple interesting things going on. I mean, one thing I find alarming is that I, I think we, uh, the president has played a big role in this, although he's not alone, and it's also our media environment and our social media environment, but there has been a really glaring erosion in the trust uh, we hold in institutions. And I think that's part of the reason why there's been so much confusion over what the best advice is over, on how to control the pandemic. You know, here in New York, the pandemic is under very good control at the moment. And yet people just don't trust that the doctors and uh, public officials who are saying our schools can open actually know what they're talking about. They believe, uh, you know, we're in grave danger nonetheless. And I think that's a reflection of just the, this sowing of distrust in institutions and the president through his you know, consistent undercutting of public health authorities and you know, those uh, leaders like Dr. Fauci, you, know, you can sort of feel the pain in their, in their grimace as they stand next to the president and he says something outlandish and they know that if they call him out, you know, as under normal circumstances, you would, that they will be exiled and that they'll lose their influence and that uh, they won't be able to insert their expertise in trying to shape the policy. And so I can understand the bargain that they make, but you know, what it has done is really undercut public faith in our, our uh, you know, what should be our trusted health authorities. And I think people do not know where to turn. And uh, you know, some err on the side of caution, some throw caution to the winds, but there's just no consensus about who you could trust when it comes to what you ought to be doing in this situation. You know, where we have had more of a, a kind of, I would say, a qualified success is actually online, where the platforms have been very aggressive in taking down COVID-related misinformation, quackery, and conspiracy theories, and they've relied heavily on algorithms to do it, in part because their human content moderators can't sort of come into the call center during this period. And... They've also elevated credible information. If you search for COVID on Facebook or on Google, you'll see CDC and WHO information coming up to the top of your feed. And so it's actually demonstrated that they have a greater ability to control content on their platforms than many people previously believed. And so I think it's been very positive. There are difficult line drawing questions. They've adopted a new standard, which is that they will remove content that is associated with the potential for imminent harm. So if it's somebody promulgating a false cure, the president talking about hydrochloroquine or saying on Fox News the other day that children are immune from the virus and you can kind of draw a direct link between how that information might cause harm, the platforms now will take it down. 
you know, I think there, there, where, where it may go too far is, you know, what if there's a doctor who's had a certain experience in their practice and they've witnessed, a, a, you know, a particular type of treatment working and they want to discuss that or get feedback? Is that something that should be banned from Facebook because, uh, you know, it hasn't been verified by the WHO or the CDC at this point? You know, I think a lot of us would think, well, there should be a space to discuss that and to share information and you know you know that what you hear on Facebook isn't entirely definitive so I think there's some difficult line drawing questions and this is where again uh, I think what's missing from the picture is sort of this recourse for people who believe their content has unjustifiably been taken down because certainly they're taking down reams of COVID related uh, misinformation you know by and large a very good thing but we uh, ought to have a fail safe to ensure that it doesn't go too far. So one of the main themes that runs through the book is uh, really the First Amendment. And I'm curious because you are a, a trained lawyer and uh, prior to your work with PEN America, would you have considered yourself uh, an expert in the First Amendment? I mean, I, there are many legal scholars who I know make entire careers as their so-called First Amendment scholars. And until I read the book, I never really thought of you that way, but um, you certainly do an excellent job in marshalling all of the case law. You know, I'm not a First Amendment scholar. And, you know, one of the points I make in the book also is that there's so much in terms of what we're grappling with and much of the, what we've talked about tonight, whether it's call-ins or call-outs, you know, or safe spaces on campus or uh, these debates over online content. So many of our free speech battles today actually barely implicate the First Amendment. I mean, most Americans, when you hear about free speech, you kind of almost reflexively say First Amendment, because that's how we were all, you know, trained in elementary school. And the First Amendment and its prohibition on government, uh, most kinds of government encroachments on free speech is very important, but uh, it, it doesn't solve any of these issues, you know, many of these issues that were grappling with today, which is one of the reasons in the book that I sort of argue that we as citizens and institutional leaders actually take, need to take up the mantle of defending free speech because we can't rely on the courts and uh, uh, the lawyers in cases where uh, government intervention in speech is not the problem. The problem is something else. It's, it's the nature of social media or it's the censoriousness of the mob or you know, excessive wokeness in the classroom. Uh, and, and the chilling effect that that can have. So I, you know, I think that's, important, that's an important sort of amendment to how we understand, uh, or evolution, how we understand our free speech rights and what it's gonna take to uphold them is that it, it, it's not enough to simply rely on the First Amendment. You know, when it comes to the First Amendment, there are also you know, a few things that as someone who you know, is not a scholar, uh, but has kind of come up against this, you know, I sort of realized were very important things for me to understand that I thought other people would find useful as well, including, you know, just a simple inventory of what the exceptions to the First Amendment are, because the First Amendment doesn't uh, protect all kinds of content. And so, you know, there's things like libel and defamation and uh, slander and true threats and incitement to imminent violence and a number of other categories that are well-developed exceptions to the First Amendment. So, you know, particularly for young people who sort of feel free speech uh, doesn't do enough to protect them, you know, it's, if you're gonna argue that we should allow for more encroachments on free speech, it's helpful to at least understand, you know, which ones are permitted under the constitution and the case law as of today. So that's something that I, I set out and that, you know, I, I found kind of conceptually useful to just kind of get in your head, the idea, okay, there's the first amendment, but there are several categories of important exceptions. Right. And it, I mean, it, it's almost that part of it, the case law, it, I mean, does read like a, a 20th century American history in some ways, or even back to the 19th century to some extent. Um, and it is really interesting. And in, in those exceptions, those, those sort of well articulated exceptions like incitement or imminent threat. I, I mean, I, to me, having no legal background, it was, it was actually really interesting to learn, to learn the case law. Um, I was wondering too, you uh, early in your career, very early in your career, actually wrote another book um, called Presumed Equal, which I wanted to spend a minute on because I thought it was so interesting. And you and a, and a colleague, I think if I understood correctly, um, you queried many um, female attorneys about what their experiences were at their major law firms. 
And um, I was wondering if you could just share about that experience. Yeah, sure. I mean, thanks for asking about it. It's sort of ancient history at this point, but we <laughs> did it when we were in law school and it was, uh, you know, it's embarrassing to admit, but this is like basically before the internet and before email. So we did a mailed in survey of women at large law firms. So we asked them about sexism and discrimination and stereotyping and work and family issues and opportunities for advancement. And our notion was basically that we would rate and rank these firms and kind of shame the ones that did the worst into taking a look at these issues and, and, and making change and doing better for their women employees. And actually it was quite effective. Uh, you know, it was, it was a great project. It was very simple. And we later ended up publishing it uh, as a book and we rated and ranked these firms and the ones that did poorly were very upset about it. And they started kind of scrambling and creating task forces. And yeah, that's what we hope for. But you know, I'd say the lesson of it though, was what really needed to happen was the Harvard Women's Law Association, which is what we were part of when we started it, needed to commit to and be funded to do that project, you know, like say every two or three years. Like if that had happened, I think that really would have driven a lot of change. It wasn't enough. We actually ended up doing it twice, but that was not enough. So, so the Harvard Women's Law Association never carried it on forward after your work? They, they did it like one more time, like maybe 15 years later, we found out they were doing it again. We were delighted, but they, you know, it was, it's students. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's like a club like that is animated by whoever is there in the yes. moment and how much energy they have and what their priorities are. So it's not something that you can kind of dictate into perpetuity. But there's a whole franchise idea right there, you know, like the U.S. News and World Report top uh, law firms for women every year, you, you know, or Harvard, the Harvard seal of approval on law firms for women. Um, you have had a fascinating career. Um, you know, most recently, of course, your, your career is the CEO at PEN America, but um, you have a lot of government experience as well. And I was wondering uh, if you could share with our audience, you worked at the United Nations um, and, and actually you do tell a little bit about it in the book and in, including this um, amazing thing that you did that I still to this day cannot understand, but you talk about in this word that I had never heard before. When you think about the word arrears, the United States was constantly in arrears to paying our United Nations dues. And so one of your jobs became um, rectifying the arrearage at the United Nations. Could you tell us about that experience, what that was like sure. and who worked with yeah. it? Uh, this was during the the very end of the Clinton administration, and the, yeah, the U.S. had like a billion and a half dollars in arrears to the U.N. that had been accumulated over the years through various congressional withholdings and basically a refusal to uh, pay certain dues that we owed and a refusal to appropriate the monies necessary. And so this big bill had built up, and uh, you know every U.N. meeting that we went into, they would sort of chide us to pay your dues on time, in full, and without conditions, you know, before we could open up our mouths and talk about <laughs> Iraq or, uh, you know, Israel-Palestine or any other issue. And it was really embarrassing. We were also in the longest period of sustained prosperity in U.S. history. So we had kind of no excuse for this. And so we had a law that had been passed that basically said we could pay back the bulk of our arrears, but only if we could get the U.N. membership to agree to rewrite its system of assessments, basically so that we would pay less of the U a, less, a lesser share of the UN's budget going forward. So we had to get that agreement among the 192 countries of the UN before we could pay what we already owed them. So it was not a popular policy. And the sort of challenge was to get this agreement. And it was, it was sort of a wonderful professional challenge because it literally had to be consensus of 192 countries and they had to accept bigger bills like actually paying more which none of them wanted to do you know and especially to let us pay less like it was a, it was an egregious position for us to have taken but we had to sort of uh, uh get it through by hook or by crook and you know figuring that out uh was an amazing experience. I traveled all over the world to meet with a lot of these countries and capitals. And you, know, you just got to work with every single delegation at the UN, big and small, because they were all affected and they all had to buy in. And so, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, and we succeeded in the end. We got the deal, uh, which was very exciting. 
Yeah, I mean, that's just amazing because you, you, you can't even get, you know, oftentimes four, three or four countries to agree on something and you've got 192. I mean, I still think that that should go down in the, the annals of, you know, world history. Is, is People an still topic. call me. Like, they'll, I'll still, I still get calls. Like, when the U.S. is thinking about, like, this arrear scale of assessment is up for renegotiation, I still get calls of people wanting to know, like, how this was done. So, uh, you know, there is, there's some institutional memory, I guess, about it. Wow, that's very impressive. Well, um, let's come back to Dare to Speak, your current book that we're talking about. I guess I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind, um, you know, if you get asked this in, you know, soundbite interviews, this is a more expansive interview, but you have, you know, what's nice about the book and, uh, you know, as a nice edited feature is that it, in and sort of at the end of each chapter, you have really good bullet point summaries of your kind of advice or even an outline. And, the, and then the, the um, outline is fleshed out nicely in the chapter. But I was wondering if you could just um, give our audience here some, some of the general principles that you recommend for you know, daring to speak essentially. And, and essentially, uh, I mean, if I had to summarize it, I'd say that really it's important that you be open-minded, but put yourself in the position of the listener and be um, sympathetic and empathetic. But that's of course way too simplistic a summary. What are some of the sort of bullet point principles that I guess, you, you know, you probably get asked about at every one of these interviews? Yeah, sure. I mean, and, and you know, I think you've put your nail on the, the, the nail on the head with the idea that particularly living in our increasingly diverse society, that a, a big part of my argument is that you have to be cognizant of who is in your audience and what their sensitivities and pressure points are. And, you know, this is not the 1950s where you're writing for a newspaper that, uh, you know, has a readership that consists of the 20,000 people in your town, the demographics of whom, uh, you know, resemble precisely your own. Like that's not how our ecosystem works anymore, whether you're in a classroom or you're writing on social media or you're publishing something in a magazine, it's going to a much more diverse audience of people with all kinds of backgrounds, interests, orientations, and ideologies. And so you have to think through as you write, you know, particularly you don't, you know, most of us are not intentionally trying to offend people. And, you know, it's not good enough to simply not have that intent, but you actually, need to go out and understand something about this audience and what their, you know, com what the composition is, what their hot buttons are, you know, how old they are, what terminology they may use, uh, you know, to refer to certain things. And, you know, I refer to it in, in one section as being your own editor. I mean, if you think about the role that editors have historically played in, you know, carefully going over your work and asking questions and pointing out where things may be subject to misinterpretation. It's like we all have to internalize that function for ourselves. And you know, when we're speaking, take that extra level of care. And I say particularly, I have a chapter on what I call the duty of care, which you know, in my mind escalates the larger the platform that you have. I mean, you're a university president. So you know, what you say around your dinner table may be one thing, but what you say behind the podium when you're speaking to your students or you're uh, giving a media interview is quite different. You're representing the university in that setting. And, and I think it's fair that you're held to a higher standard of forethought and awareness if you're talking about a topic, you know, where you're not an expert, not just you, but, uh, you know, when, when <laughs> one is speaking about something, uh, you know, that isn't your particular bailiwick or you're talking about a community that you're not part of, you know, I think the burden is, is, is heightened in that situation to do your research. Maybe you want to run it by somebody who has that expertise or is from that community, you know, to make sure that your words are going to land in the way that is intended. So I think to exercise free speech responsibly in this diverse digitized world, you know, does require an extra level of care and forethought. At the same time, I argue, you know, and one of my other principles is that, you know, we need to be willing to do the work of making uh, difficult arguments and putting forward unpopular ideas and that there are ways of doing it that can help uh, uh, you get your message across without it being impeded by misperceptions, uh, people being offended, uh, and you can neutralize a lot of the hostility, you know, if you're careful in how you marshal your argument, if you anticipate the counter arguments, uh, 
you know, if you avoid uh, unintentional offense and you kind of scrub your message of anything that might be misconstrued, there are ways of making these arguments that give you a better shot of being heard and actually persuading someone. And so I, I feel strongly what I don't want to see is people just sort of retreat and say, look, it's too difficult. There's too much risk of blowback. You know, nobody's going to appreciate my weighing in on, you know, whether the topic is abortion or police reform or Israel, Palestine, or, you know, even electoral politics. There's so many topics right now where, you know, it, it's quite uh, understandable that people just, you know, sort of turn the other way because the risk of getting into a fraught interaction seems so high. And so I think it's important both that we support one another to make difficult arguments and that we are willing ourselves to, you know, the book is called Dare to Speak, but to, uh, you know, voice our viewpoints even when we know they may be controversial. Well, um, you mentioned, you know, the, the pulpit or the, or the podium that one has, and, and it's important to think about, you know, where you are uh, in terms of who your uh, particular audience is and what speech can impact. And I couldn't help but think of uh, Larry Summers, who uh, previously was president of Harvard University, and um, probably most of our audience is familiar with this story, but if, if I guess if you could just share what what he said and, and why why it w was important, you know, he, people were calling for him to resign from the position, which ultimately he did. Yeah, I mean, he was at an academic conference and he basically called into question whether women have the same natural aptitude as men when it comes to math and science and suggested that you know, gave credence to some research that indicates that they may not. And, you know, that, I believe firmly that type of research and, and conversation should not be off limits. I mean, if there's data that shows that, you know, I don't think the best answer is to bury it and, and insist that it never be surfaced or talked about again. I, th I think it should be looked at it. People should be able to debate it and, and, you know, perhaps contradict it. And, you know, it's hard for me to believe that's really that conclusive or persuasive. But the problem in his case is that he spoke as the president of Harvard University and uh, carried all the authority and weight of that position. And so how could women in the university thereafter not wonder whether he thought they had the equivalent talents and aptitudes of their male counterparts? And so you know, his ability to run that institution as an institution offering equal opportunity to women on the faculty and in the student body, you know, I think was pretty fundamentally called into question. And so when you have an institutional leader who, uh, you know, through something they say undercuts confidence that they can lead the university, uh, you know, embodying the, the values that that institution stands for and treating people equally, you know, that, that can be, you know, and it was in his case, like, you know, kind of fatal to his leadership. And, uh, you know, it's a very harsh draconian consequence for speech, but I do think the stakes are higher, uh, you know, the more lofty your position is and that the duty of care has to be stronger and that for him, that might have been a perfectly acceptable thing to say if he was, you know, among a small group of friends or back when he was on the, the Harvard faculty. But he had to recognize as the university president that you sort of no longer have that leeway and that it's, it could be construed in a way that really could undermine a significant segment of the population that you serve and represent as president. Well, let's, uh, let's end on one other example of a college president. Um, and this was an example I actually wasn't aware of until you brought it to my attention, but I, it's Ken Fuchs, who either is or was president of the University of Florida. And you detailed how he very adroitly handled um, an incident where Richard Spencer, a, a famous hate monger, was uh, invited to speak on campus. And you make the distinction between public and private universities. And as a public university, the University of Florida could not uh, elect to bar Spencer from speaking. But Fuchs gave kind of what you paint as a shining example of how uh, leadership should respond in this situation. Yeah, I mean, this was a set of controversies a couple of years ago where you had Richard Spencer, the avowed white supremacist, and Milo Yiannopoulos, who is more just uh, a kind of garden variety provocateur 
going around to college campuses and insisting on speaking. And sometimes where possible, they would elicit an invitation from a student group. Sometimes they would just book an auditorium where they could. And their purpose really was to be shut down. What they wanted more than anything else, and this happened to Milo Yiannopoulos at Berkeley, was for the university to call it off and insist that they couldn't speak so that they could then become a great champion of free speech and sue the university and grandstand and rally their followers to protest this outrage. And you know, this is part of what gave free speech sort of a bad name on many campuses over a period of time. And what we advocated as PEN America and what I think Fuchs did well was to avoid falling into that trap and not give the Spencers and the Yiannopoulos of the world the gratification of being shut down, but instead say, all right, fine, you come speak on campus. You know, let me make clear that you, you know, the fact that you're coming here you know, you know, in no respect cons constitutes an endorsement or ratification of you or your message. And when Spencer tried to characterize it that way, Fuchs shot him down. And then he did his own campaign. It was Gators, not haters. Uh, to right. reject the message, the, both uphold Spencer's right to speak, but be crystal clear that the administration and the institution condemned his message. And so, you know, there are two things that the university leadership in these situations has to be able to do at one time. It's like walking and chewing gum. They have to both uphold First Amendment rights and reinforce the values of the institution. And I think he did that well. Well, Suzanne, um, this has been great. And the, the book is, is absolutely fascinating. It's compelling. And I think comes at a, a very timely moment uh, in our nation's history. And there it is right behind you. Yes, oh, yeah. Dare to Speak. You pulled it up also. Please um, buy it from Magic City Books. Yeah, yeah. and apparently <laughs> in, the, um, in the chat, there are several um, links you can go to if you want to order the book from Magic City, which is an independent nonprofit bookstore. Um, and you can also get the discounted um, membership in PEN America. PEN um, Friends, yes. Yes, um, Friends of PEN America, thank you. And um, listen, congratulations on your book and thank you so much for joining us and um, please stay safe with you and your family uh, during the pandemic. And I know that you have um, many, uh, you have an extensive virtual book tour. And so we were delighted that you um, were, you made this, this virtual stop here in Tulsa and we hope to see you uh, when circumstances allow. Likewise, thank you so much for doing this, John. It was great to see you. Uh, I feel like I visited your house uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, made a little foray into your city and, and your life. And thank you so much, Jeff and Magic City and everybody. Uh, it's a wonderful store and we're so proud to have a chapter of Pet America in Tulsa. Yeah. So please join it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Have a good night.